Welcome to this module of Professor Messer's free Microsoft 7680 certification training course. This module is on remote connections, and this is the first of two modules on remote connections. I'm James Messer, and in this module, we've broken it up into two pieces just because this section of this section six items for configuring remote computing that deal with mobility options is many and varied. And it goes through not only connecting and setting up virtual private network connections, including some new capabilities called VPN Connect. It also includes dial-up connections and then a lot of other things that you need to know after the connection is made, like security auditing, remediation, remote desktop, published applications, and others. So instead of doing this all in one big video, I've split it up into two videos and I've tried to piece together the things that make sense. So in this video, this part one, we're going to focus solely on connecting. We're going to look at the different technologies used for authentication, for doing virtual private networks, and see what it takes inside of Windows 7 to get that all working. As we become more mobile, virtual private networks have become much more important. When we're working inside of our corporate network, we're in a building where the doors have locks on them. The security of the network is all in a single room. We know that, that all of our networking equipment is locked up. And we're not so concerned about people tapping into your communication between your workstation and a server or a, a mail server or another printer because you know the people that are in your building are people that are working with you. You know them. But if you're outside of your building, you're at a coffee shop, you're in a hotel room overnight, you want to use the network, you still need to have a way to have a secured link between your computer and your corporate or enterprise environment. That's why we created virtual private networking so that you can create what we call an encrypted tunnel between your workstation and what we call a VPN concentrator. And that VPN concentrator might be an appliance that you purchase. It might be a Windows Server 2008 R2. But its primary job is to be an endpoint between you and this single connection back to your network where you'd send all of this data back to your network over an encrypted tunnel. If somebody was to look inside of those packets, they would just see gobbledygook. They would not be able to understand exactly what was inside of those packets. Your VPN concentrator then is in charge of taking that information, decrypting it, and dropping it off inside of your inside corporate network. And that means that you're going to have very secure connectivity between your workstation outside of your network and that concentrator so that no matter what happens between you and the corporate environment, you're still protected. And once you're connected now to your corporate network, you have access to the same servers, the same shares, the same printers and resources that you always have connectivity to when you are inside of your corporate network. When we start talking about virtual private networking, then I'm going to focus on two different kinds of protocols. One is an authentication protocol, and one is a VPN, or what we call an encryption protocol. These are pretty important. There are specific protocols that are used just to get you authenticated and build that tunnel to the VPN concentrator. And there are a number of different authentication protocols that you have to choose from. We'll step through each one of those so you know the advantages and disadvantages of all of them. Once you are then authenticated, you've provided your authentication credentials, you then need to send data over an encrypted tunnel. And there is a completely different group of VPN or encryption protocols that are used to send that information. When you're setting up and configuring your VPN concentrator or configuring a Windows 7 device, you need to know what to configure for your authentication protocol and what to configure for your VPN protocol. Authentication protocols have evolved as the years have gone by. We first started with a very, very simple type of authentication protocol called PAP. And that stands for Password Authentication Protocol. It sends passwords in the clear down a connection. When you're, you're setting up a connectivity, you really don't want to use this. We used this a lot when we had dial-up links, and we weren't really concerned about people tapping into our connection because at that time, there really was no World Wide Web. There was no internet to choose from, so we didn't have to worry so much about people looking into those links. Obviously, you see the word unencrypted passwords. It's not something that you would normally want to use. With the limitations of PAP, we realized we needed some different kinds of authentication protocols. So we created one called CHAP, Challenge Authentication Protocol. This protocol has also been around for a very, very long time. What CHAP did was take your, your password, run an algorithm through it that created this hash. And you couldn't easily reverse 
that hash to be able to understand what the password was. So it was a good way to scramble up your password in a way that no one would be able to unscramble. The problem with this, of course, is that if you don't know how to unscramble it, then you simply perform the same algorithm across every possible word you can think of and every combination of letters and numbers to try to brute force attack that. And that, of course, being sent in the clear means that if somebody got the hash, they could spend a lot of time trying to do some brute force on that hash and ultimately figure out what your password was. So perhaps that wasn't the best authentication protocol to use either. Microsoft took the idea of this CHAP and created a Microsoft version of CHAP called CHAP v2. What that did was automatically integrate your Windows authentication into the authentication process over your dial-up or your virtual connection. One of the concerns, of course, is that it's still CHAP. You still have a hash, and you can still perform brute force with that. At this point, we realized we need some different ways to do authentication, which were much more secure, and perhaps we're taking advantage of some of the newer encryption technologies out there. One of those new types of technologies, in fact, it's one that's used almost everywhere, is something called Extensible Authentication Protocol. You'll see that abbreviated as EAP. And if you encrypt that authentication protocol, it becomes a protected Extensible Authentication Protocol, or PEEP. It's encrypting that EAP authentication over TLS, so very similar to the protocols that are used to encrypt data to a web server. It's very it's certificate-based, it's very secure, and you'll see that not just Microsoft products take advantage of EAP or PEEP on top of that, but many, many manufacturers do. It's a very standard way to do things. Microsoft has taken that and added EAP2, it's Microsoft CHAP version 2, so that you could not only do the same CHAP and in integration with your Windows login, but now you add the security of PEEP right on top of that. And that gives you a lot of flexibility. And in many cases, your end users don't have to do anything. They connect to a connection over this EAP Microsoft CHAP v2. They don't have to put in any additional usernames and any additional passwords to make that work. If you really want it to be super secure on top of that, you can enable something like a certificate-based authentication or perhaps use a smart card. The certificates are software certificates that are loaded on your workstation. And that would ensure that only workstations that you have given that certificate are able to connect back to the main facility over that VPN connection. If you have a smart card, it works similarly. You load your smart card and plug it into your laptop. And the smart card being there recognizes, yes, you are there with your card. And then now we can create that connection back. If you are on a laptop and you don't have the smart card, you won't be able to have that VPN connection back to the central facility. So that's adding another layer of security on top of this that would restrict access to only machines you really, really wanted to restrict access from. Once you've now authenticated, you've done your PAP, your CHAP, your Microsoft CHAP v2, your EAP Microsoft CHAP v2, or you've got your certificate already loaded or your smart card, now it's time to build the tunnel. We know who you are. We trust your username and password. Now we need to encrypt all of that data going between point A and point B, and it's our VPN protocols that are going to do that for us. This allows us to first, of course, encrypt the data. That's going to be very important so that if somebody looks into that communication, they won't be able to see what's inside of that. But there's some additional functionality we can get from these VPN protocols. One of them would be data integrity, which makes sure that the data we sent is exactly the data that we received on the other side. And there are checksums and other methods set up between point A and point B that ensures that along the way, none of that data happened to be corrupted. That's especially helpful if you're over some mobile phone connections or connections where you're not quite certain the data is going to get there all in one piece. Another nice capability is data authentication. We want to be sure that if you are the person that sent that data, when it received it on the other side, that it can be sure that you're the one who sent it. Now, that's very important if you're running over links where you want to be sure nobody's catching that data in the middle and pretending to be you. In fact, we call that replay protection. This is a very common way to get into the middle of encrypted connections. If that bad guy has your encryption information, it can decrypt it. It can capture your information, decrypt it, and look at the data then package it back up and send it on its way. With this replay protection that we have in a number of these VPN protocols, we know of somebody sitting in the middle. And when that happens, we can make sure that that connection does not occur. And lastly, a lot of this can be done automatically. And when you have Windows 
uh, systems and you want to be sure to make your end user experience as seamless and easy as possible, we can just have Windows figure out what is most secure and no matter what you're connecting to, it's going to use the most secure connection. If you have the option to use Ike version 2, that's the one you want to use. It really is the most secure option. This Internet Key Exchange version 2 is used not just in Microsoft environments, but many, many other types of environments as well. And Microsoft has added some nice capabilities when you're using this type of VPN encryption. For instance, you can use IPv6 over this connection, and you can do something called VPN reconnect. We're going to talk more about what that is in just a bit. If you're using Ike v2, then you have a number of authentication options available to you. You can use your PEEP and your EEP, your smart cards, your other certificates, but you cannot use some of those less secure protocols like PAP, CHAP, Microsoft CHAP version 2. You'll also notice that that encrypted tunnel is going to send all of that data through the link using the UDP protocol over port 500. So if you go in and look at a protocol decode, you'll be able to see pretty quickly all of that UDP traffic going over that tunnel, and you'll know that that is your Ike v2 tunnel. If you're integrating Windows 7 with a third-party VPN solution, you may not have the luxury of using Ike v2. So Windows supports some other VPN protocols as well. One of these is SSTP, Secure Socket Tunneling Protocol. And you'll notice that it uses TCP over port 443. And if you think of to your Windows technologies and your web technologies, then you know that's the same port number that's used for secure web connections. So it makes it very, very easy to use this through firewalls that allow port 443 over TCP through them. One thing to keep in mind, though, is that this does not work very well through proxies. It doesn't work at all through proxies. Proxies stop a connection and create their own connection out. And this type of SSTP tunneling protocol simply won't allow that. It needs to be a much more secure connection. And so proxies cannot be in the middle of an SSTP connection. Another type of VPN protocol you can use is something that is very, very standardized. This is very common to see, which is L2TP using IPsec. This is a layer 2 tunneling protocol. That's what that L2TP stands for. So it tunnels with the L2TP, and it encrypts using a standard encryption mechanism called IPsec, or IP security. Many, many third-party VPNs use this protocol, so you may find yourself setting up that specific VPN protocol when you're connecting to third-party devices. And your last option for encryption technologies is one that perhaps you don't want to use when you're on Windows 7 unless you're connecting to a legacy VPN technology. It's called PPTP, Point-to-Point -point Tunneling Protocol. It is, in the Windows 7 world, the least secure VPN protocol you can choose from. It does encryption, so you've got that going for you, but it does not allow or provide for any data integrity. It does not provide for any built-in authentication functionality. So you, if your only choice is PPTP, you do have the option, but if you've got the option of using some of these other VPN protocols, you'd be much better off doing so. We are increasingly a very, very mobile workforce. It's very common for road warriors to get on the road and go from state to state to state in a single day, connecting to multiple networks in a single day from multiple devices. And we found that for VPN technology, we needed a way to adjust to that type of lifestyle. And so this VPN reconnection capability was added to Windows 7. This allowed us to have a VPN up and running, but every time we moved from connection to connection, from network to network, our VPN would automatically adjust and reconnect without having to reprompt us to do anything. And if you're concerned about the security of your workforce and the security of what they're putting on the network, this is just one other thing that they don't have to think about. They connect to the VPN at the beginning of the day, and throughout the entire workday, they're always going to be connected to the network. And then, of course, your network administrator can adjust how long and how often you would have to re-authenticate to be able to do that. It uses this tunneling protocol we mentioned earlier called Ike v2. And it uses an extension on top of that, which is the Ike v2 Mobility and Multi-Homing extension. You'll see it abbreviated as M-O-B-I-K-E. This means that no matter where you go, what, no matter what IP address you are on, no matter what wireless or wired network you happen to connect to, your Ike v2 tunnel will always continue to work completely seamlessly. You won't have to do a thing. Your administrator can set up how long it takes before you'd have to reconnect 
uh, authenticate or reconnect to that VPN, the maximum timeout is eight hours. So if you think about that, you can connect first thing in the morning and throughout the work day, you will always be connected to that VPN. It can take as long as eight hours till it finally says, okay, I've, I've waited eight hours. You're going to have to re-authenticate with your username and password across that. And this is, of course, configurable by your administrator and adjustable depending on how they would like their security features to be for that reconnection capability. Back before there was the World Wide Web, back before we had these Ethernet connections everywhere, when you traveled and wanted to connect back to the home office, you had to plug into a telephone line. And those technologies are still being used today. Not used a lot for mobile people, but for remote access from remote sites, especially sites that may not have access to cable modem technology. It may not be practical to put a satellite link in place. Maybe you don't have the ability to have a DSL line, so you simply plug into a phone line. It certainly is very cost effective, and all you need to do is on occasion upload a little bit of data. That may be a perfect solution for you, and you may be surprised at just how many people are still using those dial-up connections. Of course, you can still use dial-up connections from your mobile devices, certainly. You would set up a new connection from your network and sharing center, and all you have to be sure that you have on your computer is a modem, and you would have a standard POTS, a plain old telephone system telephone line to plug into that has a dial tone on it. And from that point on, you're able to use that dial-up connection. Those same protocols apply, though. That's those same authentication protocols apply, and the same VPN technologies apply. And whether you're on a dial-up connection or an Ethernet connection or a wireless connection, it doesn't matter. Whatever is flowing across those pipes or these dial-up connections is going to be exactly the same type of data. Let's review some of the things we've learned in this remote connection video. Which authentication protocol normally sends password information as unencrypted text? If you recall, that's one we probably don't want to use when we're using these authentication protocols. And that would be the password authentication protocol, normally shortened as PAP. The next question, which VPN protocol is probably the most compatible with firewalled connections? If it's compatible with firewalled connections, it's probably using a port number that's very commonly used. And indeed, SSTP, or the Secure Socket Tunneling Protocol, just like Secure Sockets used in a web environment, uses TCP and port 443. And the last question, what is the maximum time that VPN reconnection can be configured before requiring a manual reconnect? And if that's one where you want to set it up at the beginning of the day and not be reconnected throughout the entire workday, then you'll probably have that configured for an eight hour interval. That brings us to the end of our first video on remote connections. We've looked at VPN connectivity from an authentication perspective when we build up a tunnel and encrypt data across it. We've looked at dial-up connections, and we've looked at the VPN reconnection technology that's available in Windows 7. If you'd like to watch any of our absolutely free Microsoft 7680 videos and much more at our website, you can visit us at ProfessorMesser.com.